2009, when I called my dad routinely to see how he was doing. And immediately I perceived from his broken tone that something was woefully wrong. Only a few times in my life have I heard a tone of voice over the phone that compelled me immediately to stop what I was doing and drop whatever it was to go be with whomever I was speaking with, and this was one of those times. As soon as I pulled up in front of my dad's studio apartment, I wondered what kind of strange war had just taken place here. The whole front window was shattered. There was but a hole on the front door where a door was supposed to go. Once I entered the frame of his 500 square foot apartment, the tragic scene only darkened. It looked as though a bomb had exploded in the middle of his living room. Sprawled fragments of glass dug deep into the carpet. Tables were smashed in two. Couches overturned. The space was sown in a devastation I would not see even in my journeys through the slums of Guatemala. If anything, it resembled the bombshelled houses I would eventually drive past and my distant travels through the walled encampments of Palestine. But that day I was not in a third world village. I was not in some war torn country overseas. I was in these United States of America. I was at 3455 Jackson Street. My father sat paralyzed in the corner of the living room in a state of shock Pools of blood stained the white gauze wrapped around his thighs. At this moment, whatever sourness I had previously felt towards him, pain caused from years of witnessing his heroin addiction, not only ruined his life, but robbed me of his fatherly love and intention. At that moment, that sourness had dissipated. And during this sacred moment, I saw no longer a criminal addict, but a human being in need of help a wounded man gripping his last remnants of dignity. I asked him what had happened. He told me that his brother, his two elderly friends were playing cards inside when they suddenly heard the loud shatter of his front window breaking. They then saw multiple flash grenades shoot through the window frame and felt the floor shake as the front door was forcefully snatched from its hinges by a Hummer truck my father obeyed the orders from outside to lay on the ground, but because of how he was angled, one of the flash grenades landed between his upper thighs and seared a severe burn into his skin. He wailed in agony as dozens of SWAT team agents stormed his living room, shotguns and rifles drawn, trampling the men, one officer even painfully pinning his knee into my father's burned thigh. Whatever territory went unscathed by their police boots was trampled by the demeaning slurs they pronounced. This terrorizing nightmare lasted until the lead agent shouted into the radio three words that stung more than any of the other words that preceded them. We've got nothing. We have the wrong house. They were searching for a drug kingpin. What they found were a few measly addicts. The next day I called the Denver Police Department demanding that they at least fix the damages caused by their miscalculations. The officer refused. I spoke sternly into the phone and said, had this been for white men in Cherry Hills, you know you would at least repair the damages. I said again, had this been for wealthy men in Littleton, you would issue a timely statement of apology lest they sue you. Yet you justify your actions since the four bodies you trampled belong to poor black men. He essentially laughed in my face. And I hung up the phone, feeling an unsettling sense of res resignation. My dad then had no other option but to endure a freezing Colorado winter 
with nothing but planks of wood serving as his windows and doors. For months, he could not sleep from the trauma and became jittery at the loudest sound of loud noise. Had what happened to my dad that day been the exception to urban policing, we wouldn't be here tonight. My plea for justice would be but a lone cry in a wilderness of personal angst. If it were the exception, I would attribute his story to a misfortune at hand of bad luck and swallow it whole into the inner chambers of forgetfulness. But the stories before me and your very presence with us this evening, our collective yearning for guidance from above suggest that what happened to him that night was not the exception, but the rule. Far too many of our loved ones have been brutally shattered and tossed away as collateral damage in this merciless war on drugs. A nation that spends more of its creative capital perfecting the techno technological advancements of its prisons than it, it does cultivating the education of its youth is a criminal above criminals. A government that declares a war on drugs when it has never declared a war on the poverty that inspires drug culture has foolishly chosen to medicate cancer with cyanide and prisons brimming over with black and brown inmates says less about their character than it does the character of a legal system that arbitrarily enforces its code of ethics. This cannot be America, the land of the free, so long as we are the most incarcerated society in democratic history. We cannot be the descendants of that great liberator, Jesus of Nazareth, until we, like him, proclaim that the fundamental essence of our lives is our desire to bring liberty to every captive. And when we do that, in our fighting for their liberty, we shall soon realize that because we all are one, because we all belong to each other, we ourselves are not free until they are unshackled from the cold dungeons of injustice and allowed to roam the fields of opportunity. We are not free until our justice system recognizes that no human life, no child of God can be reduced to an inmate number. We soon shall realize that none of God's children can truly be free until all of his children are free. It's freedom time today. It's freedom time today for them and for us and for all of God's children. It's freedom time today. Let's pray for freedom for all of us. Amen. Amen.